What's the word, y'all? Oh, my God. I decided that I wanted to hold the mic again. It was just a different feel to the show when I had the microphone in hand. I even went back to watch the original episodes that, that created the, the ramble or the recap, whatever you want to call it. Um, first of his time, believe it or not. The first person to hold a microphone and talk about the NBA in existence and put it on YouTube. It was me. I did it. And um, I, I went back to watch those videos and it just had a different feel than what we've been doing this season. I'm not saying what we have been doing this season was a bad thing at all. But I do like the me talking in, in front of a camera and a microphone and not really think about what I'm saying. And then going back and rewatching the video and, and realizing that I said something stupid. For example, um, we were in the bubble and I was talking about the Lakers because if you don't remember the Lakers in the regular season of the bubble or the preseason, all of that, the bubble, they look terrible. And um, and, and that video, listen, I'm a man and I can I can admit when I was wrong about something. And I guess I wasn't <laughs> I said I can admit when I was wrong. And here I am saying I wasn't wrong, but I was speculating. So I didn't say this verbatim, but I was speculating whether or not LeBron James would slow it down, because in that moment, LeBron was averaging like 15 points per game, dog. And what we've seen this season is that he can still average 30, but you probably don't want your 37-year-old to average 30 because it ain't working out great. Um, and Lakers aren't great. And I've been a guy that said plenty of times in the channel I was going to refrain of talking about the Lakers um, extensively until I got a bigger sample size. Over 30 games into the season, they still are bad. Uh, but this video was <laughs> this video is not supposed to be about the Lakers, but that's what the that's what the ramble is, ladies and gentlemen. So we had a slate of games today that was super interesting and super fun. I will say that DeJounte Murray, I'm giving you your love right now with your 24, 12, and 13. I did not watch your game, my boy. I'm gonna make it my um sole purpose next tomorrow morning to watch this game that was a 20-point blowout. Because I feel like DeJounte Murray is one of those players that I absolutely would love if I watched more of him. When I do watch him, I do enjoy watching him play, but I just the Spurs ha have this po point in my mind where it's like a mental block and it goes from the years of Tim Duncan where I just wasn't watching it because in my mind they were boring in reality they were just good and now I don't know I w would you call them boring I haven't even watched out of the 30 games I can count on a single hand how many times I've tuned into the Spurs games and you know what that's my fault that's not their fault that's my fault so DeJounte I promise you tomorrow morning I will be tweeting about you because I will watch this game but I watched the other ones. And, and I hit my boy Bucks up. Shout out to Bucks. He's my thumbnail designer. He's been doing it for what seems like two or three years now. Um, and he is so flexible. Typically, I'll just tell him the title of my video, and he'll come up in his brain and come up with something great. And I told him, let me let me read you what I told um what I told him that the title of this video was. And I don't know if I'm sticking to it. Rambling about the NBA and making people upset. Because I want to stir the pot on many things. Uh, <laughs> I want to stir the pot on many things. Let's talk about the Kings at the top of the show. Let's see what that gets us. They went against the Golden State Warriors today. The Golden State Warriors are the best team in basketball. Um, I guess you can say that. I'm not looking at the standings, but I know it's them and the, the Suns at the top. And, you know, they're missing some players like everybody in the world is. And uh, So they had Jonathan Kamingo start. Shout out to Jonathan Kamingo. He had his, like a 20-plus game, 27-point game, if I'm not mistaken, last game. And then um, I guess it was Steve Kerr. He was asked about it. Um, he was and Steve Kerr basically told him if we were a rebuilding team or a bad team, you can put that up every single night where we're trying to win and we're trying to develop you. So in today, he only played six minutes. He put up 27 the game before and, and got six minutes the game after development. A little bit different on the, on the warrior side. Let's see how that works out for them, man, uh, because obviously he can hoop. But they're, they're playing so well. Like, Iggy has such a game. He threw the behind-the-back pass, and he's playing good defense, yada, yada, yada. And when you have him playing well, you have OP playing well, and you got Gary Payton the second who don't want to call um, – he doesn't want to be called what, the mitten, which is a missed opportunity if you ask me. But I understand. The glove feels more like a, a real nickname with some value. And, like, it's not necessarily soft. But when I think about a mitten, I'm thinking about it. So, like, you could say a glove, a baseball glove, a yada, yada, yada. They could have some thick leather on that. That was Gary Payton. And a mitten, I kind of think of, like, oh, you know what I'm saying? Oh, I don't even have fingers. Um, I don't – oh, oh, stirring the pot about the Kings. Okay. So, the last couple days, um, the Kings are another team that has hit he heavily with health and safety protocol and some injuries here and there. And because of that, De'Aaron Fox has been out with an injury. Um – and I am here to just say they need to build around Tyrese Halliburton because over these last couple games, what I've seen is in Tyrese is a guy that for the first year and so of his career, 
he's been trying to find the balance of being able to score or when to score and when to pass. And by nature, he is a pass first guy. And you're seeing that 11 assists today. And, you know, he's been averaging, hold on, last three games, he's averaging 11 assists per. Um, and by nature, he is a pass first guy. But with De'Aaron Fox not being in the lineup and him being the focal point of the offense, he's been able to find a balance of when to score and when not to score and when to pass. And he doesn't really have that opportunity with De'Aaron Fox. Now, I think it, I, I don't know who made the tweet and it's somebody I follow and I apologize. I mean, it was a mean tweet or a joke tweet, but it, every joke has some form of, of trueness in it, right? And they put a picture of De'Aaron Fox and 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 De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese Halliburton, and then a picture of Monte Ellis and Steph Curry, saying it was time to make that decision, where you might have to, you know, break up the backcourt for the better men of your organization. Like De'Aaron is not necessarily having a good individual season, but I still believe you can trade De'Aaron Fox and get a lot of value out of him because, what is he, 24, 25 years old? And I think most people realize that De'Aaron Fox is still a really, really good basketball player, and I would still put money on the fact that he will be an all-star eventually someday. But the backcourt last year, they struggled together. See, the Ramble was never supposed to be, like, um, uh, looking up stats and stuff, but I, I, I want to make sure that I'm still thinking about things the right way. So, yeah, last year when they were together on the court, they had a net rating of minus 4.7. Again, we're not an advanced stat channel, but I think it, it says a little bit something. And this year's at a minus 4.7. And, and sometimes you see this in NBA history all the time where two players just don't fit together. Because I want Tyrese Halliburton running my offense because what we've seen over this very small sample size that we're determining the rest of our franchise on um, is that he... With the ball in his hands, he is a great playmaker that can find the Buddy Heels of the world, the Harrison Barnes, and I guess in this case, Shemezi Metsu was a god. Um, and when you're doing something like that, when Tyrese is the primary ball handler and De'Aaron Fox is doing whatever he's doing, he's not much of a threat. If I am the opposing coach with Tyrese Halliburton at the top of the key doing what he does to try to create offense for his team, I'm not guarding De'Aaron Fox. I'm preventing him from cutting to the rim. But other than that, if he get an open look in the corner, we doing one of these on him. Shoot the ball, my boy. So I would I would love here here's the here's the two moves that I want the Sacramento Kings to do and I'm not telling them to do that right now I'm not telling them at the trade deadline trade De'Aaron Fox, but I'm saying that might that's they're gonna have to make the decision. This is what I want them to do, make the decision on De'Aaron Fox what the right pieces is or who the player is and I know there are some people that already want to see the the 76ers Kings win and I think that might be the best because the Kings need defense and and. The guy, that name I said yesterday that I wasn't going to say anymore until he's actually traded, he can bring that to you. Whatever. Figure out what that is. And second, maybe Rashawn Holmes is his dude, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Tyrese Halliburton is a guy that loves to throw the lob. Shemezi Metsu over the last couple games eating off the lobs. And maybe Rashawn Holmes is that dude when he's coming back from his injuries. But he needs a, like, real-life big old lob threat. Continue to put the shooters around him, whether it is Buddy, whereas it is a TD or, or Harrison or whoever it may be, and let him go to work, man. You want to see the playoffs? That is the key. I'm giving you the keys to the car right there. But De'Aaron, I do want to make it very, very clear, very apparent. I am still a, a big-time fan of De'Aaron Fox. All right, I just want to quickly transition to OKC versus Grizzlies because the last time OKC played against the Grizzlies, they lost by 73, and here they are with a win. And I, I guess we got to talk about this John Morant stuff because apparently, I'm looking on my, my Twitter account right now, John Morant hurt by fans telling him to sit back out as Grizzlies lose. I would... I, I don't like the wording of that article by fans telling him to sit back out, sit back out. It just don't feel anyway. I guess there were some fans courtside and in, in the process of the Memphis Grizzlies losing this game. There's some people courtside telling Ja, ah, we better without you. And if you look at the replies of his tweets, like he said he was going zero dark 30. He's not going on social media for a while, which kind of sucks because I, I think John Morant's one of the better Twitter Twitter follows and Instagram follows in the NBA. Um, if you look at the replies, 99% of fans are going to agree with me when I say John Morant is Memphis. He is the, the star of Memphis and yada, yada, yada. That one person or two people sitting courtside does not represent the entire organization for sure. But what I will say on John Morant's behalf is that it's 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 
hard to drain out that one person to say something negative about you. Even if John Morant has a million fans in Memphis that are saying, we love you here and we love you, we want to keep you here, we want you to sign that max extension when you get eligible for it, it's hard not to hear that one fan. It just is. I, I know a lot of people say, ah, you get paid millions of dollars, you got to have thicker skin, but it's easier said than done. That's all I'm really saying. Um, but Shea Gilgis Alexander, the... The clutch cheating is a real thing. I've had this conversation with, with with people, and there is a percentage a percentage of sports fans in general that will tell you, ah, the clutch gene is not really a real thing. I am a firm believer that the clutch gene is very real, and his last three games are proof of it. Shea hits a crazy half-court shot when he was trying to draw a foul, De uh, Devontae Graham ended all of that, by the way. Shout out to Devontae. Game after that, hit uh, Nicholas Batum with a nasty step back, waited one second to make sure that the that the time ran out, hits the three, and in this one, I don't remember the exact play-by-play, -play, but I think I made a tweet about it. He got an assist. These are the last couple seconds of the game. He got an assist after drawing a double team. I think it was down to Josh Giddy who will talk about um, um Coach uh, Mark D., end up drawing a good baseline out of bounds play or sideline out of bounds play that I've definitely seen some high school teams run. Got an open layup for Shea. He got a steal, then iced it with two free throws. Now, it wasn't the step back game winner like Nicholas Batum's game, but like those are super clutch plays from one of the youngest up and coming stars in the NBA. And I will not forget about it because he because Bleacher Report has not has not apologized a month ago. Less than a month ago, they were ranking the 24 players under 24. And Talon Hort Talon Horton Tucker was above Shea. This team lost by 73 to this exact organization two weeks ago. And Shea comes in and is like, oh, I'm going to win us this game. And he did. Now, okay, it wasn't all Shea because Lou Dort still has his three-point streak in this game. I mean, he was 27% from three, but, hey, he hit his three. Um, and he ended up having a big time block down the stretch. We're gonna count that. And Josh Giddy, um, career high, at least I think he tied a career high, ended up with 11 assists, and that's coming off a game two nights ago where he had 18 rebounds. Josh Giddy, there's a meme before the NBA draft, and they were doing like a scouting report on Josh Giddy, and it was like weaknesses, shooting, uh, <laughs> finishing, defense, and somebody quoted it, it was like so basketball, his weakness is basketball. But what we see in his weakness is not basketball. That is his strength. He can play make. He can rebound. He can hit shots. He can do a lot of different things. So shout out to Josh Giddy, man. They called him um uh oh man. What did I see his nickname was? It's not super relevant. Um go win for OKC. The Bulls got revenge on the Houston Rockets, and I needed this win for my blood and soul because the last time we played against them, we jump started this team to an eight game win streak. So I'm happy that we were able to to win this one. DeMar DeRozan being on my favorite team is a blessing. And you know what? Like I mentioned earlier, I am a guy that can admit when they're wrong. I talk about sports for a living. I'm gonna be wrong tons of tons of times. Yes, before the season started, when we were ranking small forwards in the league, I did have um, DeMar DeRozan kind of low. But here's my excuse. I, yes, I'm saying again, I was wrong, but here's my excuse. Bro was not playing an MVP caliber last season. He was not playing an all-NBA caliber last season. I did not see this coming. If you saw that DeMar DeRozan was going to jumpstart into an all-NBA player slash MVP candidate. Now, when I say MVP candidate, everybody knows it's a core four right now. It is Giannis, it is uh, Steph, it is KD, and it is um, uh, Jokic. That's core four. But if you're looking at number five, DeMar DeRozan really has a case there. You didn't see that coming. If you did, you should have put money on him, my, my guy, because you'd be a millionaire right now because the odds were not in his favor. So I did have him relatively low. Um... And I was wrong, and I'm happy I was wrong because now the Bulls are okay. Um, legitimately carrying an entire offense. Now, I would like for other people to wake up a little bit more so he doesn't have to do all of this. But again, we, we are still missing Zach Levine, who's at home watching games and everything. Shout out to DeMar DeRozan. Um, I, I, I will not disrespect you ever again in your career. Because uh, again, yeah, last year he was good. I'm not saying he was a scrub last year. He made my list. But I think it's going to be this good. And also, if you go back and watch those videos, I have a tendency of ranking my favorite player, my favorite team's players lower because I still don't know if I'm higher on my favorite favorite players than I should be because they're my favorite players. And I think I've talked about that before. I think Patrick Williams could be the next coming of 
whatever, and you may not think that way, and I, maybe it's just because he's on my favorite team. The Boston Celtics continue to let me down, and I, I mean, I guess it's not really letting me down because I'm not rooting for them, but like they were up with like three minutes to go, and I was typically we're in a party watching these games um, together, and I remember telling Mike like the 76ers are going to win this game one way or another because I was not confident in the fact that the Boston Celtics can close out this game. Now, I will say um, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown can make a ton of clutch shots, isolation shots, yada, yada. But I hate the way they close games. Even the games that they pull out where JT does hit a big shot, where JB does hit a big shot, I, I walk away from that saying, ah, good win, but it didn't have to be that difficult. When I watch Jalen and Jason play basketball, they make things look so difficult. When it's going in, it's like, man, them dudes are beasts because they make the difficult shots. But when it's not, it's hard to watch. And today, specifically talking about the last three minutes was extremely, extremely hard to watch. And what I would hate for the Boston Celtics organization to do, whether it be this season or next season, is to make the ultimate decision. And you know what I'm talking about, whether or not you want to keep or, or get rid of one of these core guys. I do not think the solution is to trade Jalen or trade Jason or pick between the two. What the team needs is a is a guy that can facilitate. Simple. I mean, oh, maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm making it way more simple than it needs to be, or than it actually is. But these dudes have not played with a person that can set them up and have a floaty offense ever, and they just need that. Down the stretch, Jalen Brown turnover. Jason Tatum turnover, they don't have the guy to set them up, and they haven't had that at all in their careers. And I would hate for them to split up these core great young players without at least trying to get them a point guard. Now, if they get them a Ricky Rubio type guy that can really facilitate and get everything going, and they still are trash, make your decision. But don't make it yet is what I'm saying. Jalen and Jason can work together. It's players 3 through 15 that can't. Now, Again, they are missing Robert Williams and Al Horford in today where they had Joel and B beating up on freedom. But still, the, the, the idea is the same for me whether or not Al is there or Big Rob Time Lord is there. They need somebody to get everybody involved, and they don't have that, all right? Um, but Joel, hey, when Joel is playing 40-plus minutes, it's a, it's, it's a sight to be seen, man. I think he's averaging 42 points per game when he's playing over 40 minutes. And they were talking about that on the Celtics broadcast, how per 36, Joel Embiid is like top five all time per 36 um, with, you know, some type of filters. Because I bet per 36 is some dude that scored one basket in his NBA career, and boom, he, his per 36 is, is 144 or whatever the math works out to be. But Joel Embiid, when he's playing a bunch of minutes, it's insane. This team won a game where they had one point contributed um, from from the bench, one singular point. Um, Tobias Harris was very, very clutch here. I love when he is a third option. Seth Curry is a Kenny for an all-star. We'll talk about him eventually one day. He's a, he's a Kenny for an all-star. He's just so damn good at his job. And what I am super impressed with with Joel Embiid is his ability or, or his in uptick in like his playmaking ability. And I'm not saying that this wasn't always there. I mean, now you have extra assists to dish out because Ben Simmons is not there. Um, this is a team playing without a point guard right now, like re real life playing without a point guard. And they ran the ball through Joel Embiid and it seemed like every single possession. And he did an amazing job when the double team started to come finding his shooters. Danny Green, big shot in the corner, and Seth Curry, 74% uh, from the field, three from three from three. Joel Embiid was amazing today. One of his best games of his career was tonight. And that's a good comeback because, again, the last time they played against each other, he stunk. And maybe that is just because Al Horford was there. I will say this, though. Even before Ennis Freedom changed his name and he was talking all on socials and going on TV shows, I will say this. And I think I'm on record saying this years ago. I like watching Ennis Cantor or Ennis Freedom get killed in a game. It's 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 so hilarious to me because oh I guess that's that's my cue after this statement. Um it's so hilarious to me because he doesn't look like he's giving effort. I'm not saying that he's not. I'm not saying Ennis, if you're watching this, I'm not saying you're not giving effort. But when I watched Joel put up 41 points today, it feels like a lot of them were like not contested shots. Some of them he was legitimately walking to the basket and it was like, here you go, here's a layup. 
but it's fun. I, I feel like 90% of centers can see freedom on the other team and when he's in the game and like, all right, let's go get some buckets. And they do. The only bad thing about these type of formatted videos is they tend to go way longer than I wanted them to. Like, I didn't talk at all about Charlotte, who can't score in the first quarter. But, the, you know, when it, once things got together, after that first quarter, they played a lot better. And LaMelo ended up with 20. Ted Rozier had a good bounce back game because I don't I don't even know if he got on the board last game. I might be exaggerating a little bit, but last game was a huge, huge stinker. I took the over on Rudy Gobert tonight. Um, this is not a plug for prize picks, but if you want to download it, go ahead and do that. I took the over because they were going against the Hornets. And just the night before, they gave they let JaVale McGee drop 19. So I'm like, hey, if JaVale McGee can drop 19, I know Rudy Gobert can give me 20. And he gave me a 20-20 piece. So shout out to him. Don't expect these to happen every night, by the way. I actually have to have something to say for me to do like a ramble even though i probably didn't say anything 